In the previous several lectures, we discussed the methods by which we can break down the protein into its individual constituent amino acids. But how exactly can we go in reverse? How can we combine the amino acids to form our protein? Now, our body synthesizes proteins in its own unique fashion and the way that we synthesize proteins in the lab, the synthetic synthesis of proteins is different than the way that our body synthesizes proteins in the cells of our body. And in this lecture we're going to focus on the synthetic or artificial synthesis of proteins, the way that we synthesize proteins in the lab. Now, in order to actually create our protein synthetically, several important issues must be overcome. Remember, a protein consists of many, many amino acids. We have hundreds and hundreds of amino acids in any given protein that basically are arranged in a very specific fashion. In fact, even if we change the order of one or two amino acids in a protein, the protein structure and function functionality can be lost entirely. In fact, this is the basis of many diseases that we have in our body as we'll discuss when we get uh, when we get into biochemistry. So, proteins consist of many amino acids arranged in a specific order and this means our synthetic protein synthesis reaction must be two things. It must be extremely specific so that we get the order right and we have to have a good percent yield at the end. We have to be able to produce a good amount of product that we can actually use at the end of our reaction. So how exactly do we go about resolving these two major issues? Now to see exactly what we mean about the specificity of the reaction, let's suppose we try to combine two very simple amino acids. Suppose glycine and alanine, so we have the glycine and the alanine, so we combine these, these two by simply taking them and placing them into some type of solution inside a beaker. The question is, what types of reactions are possible? So the reason we use glycine and alanine is because these have very simple R groups. We have an H atom and our methyl group. Notice that if we use a more complicated amino acid with a more complicated R group, even more reactions, even more side reactions are actually possible. So suppose our goal is to actually combine a glycine and an alanine in that specific order. So the first type of product that we can form is let's suppose this dipeptide where we obtain the product that we wanted to form in the first place. So we have our glycine and alanine. Now notice we have three other products that we can actually form. Because we have two amino acids, we have four different combinations that are possible. So we have glycine alanine, which is one dipeptide. We have alanine and glycine, which is a second different dipeptide. We can also form glycine and glycine and alanine and alanine. So we see that there are four different possible products that can be formed. And if we only want to form this product, Product, we have to have a way to actually effectively form only this product and avoid the other side products. So this is only with two amino acids. If we increase our amino acid number to three, four, five, and so forth, the number of different products that is possible increases tremendously. So we see that by combining only two amino acids, the simplest amino acids, this produces four different products. So if we mix more amino acids, even more will be possible. So how exactly can we actually direct and increase the specificity of our reaction to actually produce only this product and not these other products. So basically what we are trying to do is to find a way to produce our dipeptide bond, our peptide bond, 
at a specific location and to avoid all other side reactions and all other side products. Now, the best way that we can basically increase the specificity is by using some type of blocking reagent, activating and deactivating reagent. So, basically, if we take these two molecules, our glycine and alanine, we can basically uh, reduce the reactivity of this amino group by deactivating it. We can also reduce the reactivity of this carboxylate group by also deactivating it. And we can increase the reaction at this location at the carboxylate of our glycine by activating that by using some type of activating reagent, activating molecule. So in order to direct the proper reaction and increase the specificity of the reaction, we must use special reagents to activate the carboxylate group of the glycine and deactivate the carboxylate of alanine and the amino group of glycine. So by deactivating this section of glycine, we prevent these two products from forming. By deactivating this section of our alanine, we basically prevent this product and this product from forming. And by activating this section, we basically induce the production, we promote the production of this product number one. Now, what are some types of activating and deactivating reagents? So basically, if we use SOCl2, which is a thionyl chloride, we basically transform this carboxylate group into the following acid chloride. And this is a very reactive section because now we have a very good leaving group, our chloride. So we can have some type of nucleophile attacking this carbon and the nucleophile is in fact this amino group of our second amino acid. So if we take this and mix it with thionyl chloride, we end up activating this section of our amino acid. So this should have a positive charge, this should have a positive charge, and the oxygen here should have a negative charge. So this is the reagent we use to basically activate. What about deactivate? Well, one of the most common deactivating reagents in biochemistry is basically something called TBOC, which stands for diterbutyl dicarbonate. So basically, if we take this and mix it with our amino acid, let's suppose we mix it with the same glycine, what we end up doing is we blend lock this amino group from actually reacting as a nucleophile. So we transform this group here into the following group as shown and we end up basically decreasing the reaction at this location, at this uh, a nitrogen because this can no longer act as a nucleophile. So if we block this amino group, if we block this carboxylic acid group, now this can be blocked by using TBOC, but how about this one? So basically, if we transform this carboxylate group into an ester, we essentially block this from reacting. And so the way that we deactivate this carboxylate group of our alanine is by transforming this into some type of ester. So basically, we have to mix this with some type of alcohol molecule. So if we deactivate this by using our ester transformation, if we deactivate this by using our TBOC and activate this by using our thionyl chloride, we basically allow this, to, uh, this reaction to actually take place and we avoid the other three different types of products. Now the question is, once we actually block and activate the uh, groups necessary, how exactly do we go about forming that peptide bond? So basically we use a specific type of molecule known as DDC. DDC is basically a dehydrating re uh, reagent that helps this reaction to take place. So it basically propels, promotes the dehydrolysis reaction reaction in which we form the peptide bond between our two amino acids. 
So once we actually activate and block the proper groups, we need to actually form that amide bond, our peptide bond, between this region, this carbon here and this nitrogen here. So one reagent that is commonly used to aid this peptide formation is the DDC, which basically stands for dicyclohexyl carbidiamide. So once we actually form our dipeptide bond, then we can use other types of reagents to basically remove our blocking group, the T block. We can transform our ester into the carboxylate group and we can remove our activating group as well. Well, actually the activating group is removed when that peptide bond is formed. So we see that once we actually form the dipeptide, we can remove the t bond group by treating it under mild acidic conditions. Now the carboxylic acid of our alanine can be transformed into or uh, the ester group of our alanine can be transformed into our carboxylic acid by using some type of base. So basically by using our deactivating and activating groups and by using the DDC reagent that helps us form that dipeptide bond, we basically make sure that our sequence of amino acids is exactly the way that we want it to be. The question remains, how exactly do we form a good percent yield? So to form a good yield in our reaction, to form enough protein at the end, we can basically follow a procedure known as Merrifield's procedure, which is named after Bruce Merrifield, the person who came up with this procedure in the early 1960s. So basically, the procedure involves actually anchoring our peptide chain to a polymeric material. So let's suppose this purple is our polymeric material. We'll basically attach our carboxylate end of the chain to this material and then we continually attach our amino acids to this chain and the direction of attachment is beginning with our carboxylate end and ending with our amino group. So when we synthesize our protein synthetically, we begin with the carboxylate end and we end with our amino end. However, in our bodies, our body creates, synthesizes our proteins in the reverse manner, beginning with our amino group and ending with our carboxylate group. And we'll see this when we'll discuss protein synthesis in the biochemistry section. So for example, if we begin uh, with our glycine and we attach it, we anchor it to this polymeric material and then we mix it with DDC and alanine, we basically attach that alanine to our molecule as shown in the following example. So we see that the two things that we have to make sure actually takes place in any synthetic protein synthesis is we have to use the proper activating and deactivating groups to basically direct the sequence of amino acids and to increase the yield we can use Merrifield's procedure to basically attach or anchor our amino acid chain to this particular polymeric material.